James Altucher's Choose Yourself is famous for being named one of the top business books of all time. They even made an Amazon Prime docu-series about it. But don't worry if you didn't get a chance to read the book. Here are the top takeaways. Number 13. The American Dream is a Myth. It's a mythology that built up over decades and, and centuries, and it's go to college. James, he says I kicked him out of graduate school. He never showed up, so that made it very hard to keep him in graduate school. Get a solid nine to five job, rise up in that job. I read your article on why you should quit your job, and I said, should I quit my job? And then you said yes, and we talked about it. <laughs> Buy a home. I have a family, I have two kids and a white picket fence. Well, there was a fascinating story in the New York Times. The headline said something like, why self-help guru you uh, only owns 15 things. I was able to, for two years, own nothing and live nowhere. And yet, I lived quite well. Work hard every day for your boss. Retire with them, save your money in 401ks so you can retire a wealthy person. We are the only animal that can create and believe in fictional stories. There's a lot of stories on the dollar bill. <laughs> Money is probably the most successful story ever told because it's the only story everybody believes. So I think the system has been corrupted. Of course, corporate America wants you to think that the best philosophy is to stay at your job for 40 years. They don't want you to quit. Buy a home right next to the corporate factory so it's harder for you to move and quit your job. Of course, corporate America will then fund and work with hand in hand with the government at lending you an obscene amount of money to buy your house and send your kid to college because now you're in hock to the government and to the bank, your local banks in your town, and you have to keep working. You can't do what you wanna do. You can't do what gives you freedom in life because you're in prison from, from debt. So that, along with this neediness I still felt in myself, like, could a publisher choose me? Could a TV company choose me? Could an investor invest in me? I felt this need always to be chosen. I realized I needed to develop a philosophy just for me, for myself internally, to succeed. I needed to choose myself for success. Number 12. Idea muscle. So when I built a company, I didn't automatically know off the top of my head how to build this company. I had to write down, here's what the company looks like. Here's what the first page looks like. Here's what the customer experience is. Here's what the sign-up page is. Here's what the search looks like. And then I have to figure out, well, an execution step is I'm gonna spec it out and put it on freelancer.com. So those are ideas too. They're execution ideas. The idea muscle is a muscle like any other. It'll atrophy if you don't use it. You practice every day, you know, writing down 10 ideas a day, and within six months, then you can finally say, oh, my idea muscle has been exercised. Now maybe I can start coming up with good ideas. Number 11, idea sex. Search engines, okay, was a great idea in the United States. China has two billion people, and it's 20 years ago, was, the internet was starting to get popular. Let's take the search engine idea, move it to China, combine the two, and now you have Baidu, and it's a multi, multi-billion dollar company. It's one of the biggest companies in the world. So that's idea sex. Search engines plus China equals Baidu, multi-billion dollar company. Number 10, think big with thought experiments. You know, what if I invented a car that didn't have a driver? What if uh, human consciousness could be implanted into a computer and we can beam it at the speed of light to Mars instead of building a spaceship? Uh, what if I could build a filter that would take salt water out of the ocean? I have no idea how to do that, but you could start then imagining and doing thought experiments on how to do it. Number nine, seven habits of highly mediocre people. There are all these things that are considered bad habits or mediocre habits or habits that are not conducive to success. And it's just not true. Procrastination, as an example, is this really bad negative thing. If you're constantly procrastinating and then punishing yourself for it, it's like two arrows. The first arrow 
boom, hits you, that's procrastination. It wounded you. But then obsessing on it like, oh, I'm a procrastinator, I'm never going to succeed, uh, I'm horrible. That's the second arrow. The second arrow can kill you. And so what I'm trying to say here is, even that first arrow, procrastinating, there are some positives about it. So if you've thought all along, I'm mediocre because I procrastinate or I do these other six things that I mentioned, just by changing your perception about these habits that are considered negative, you could turn them into superpowers that actually make me more effective than everyone else. Society has always taught, taught you, these are negative habits. Don't do them or you won't be successful. Like everyone else out there doesn't do these habits and they're all successful. You don't want to be like everyone else because that's a competitive world. You want to be special to who you are. And a lot of people have habits that they think slow themselves down. And my argument is it doesn't have to be that way. It's your perception of them and how you can turn them into, into superpowers. Number eight, plus minus equals. You had, you had written about this concept of learning, which you called plus minus equal. Am I correct in saying that that was a message of, of yours? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I've totally stolen that. And I love giving, it. Please and not giving it. you credit at all. <laughs> but now I'm giving you credit for it completely. Yeah, all right. Frank Shamrock described to me the concept that he called plus minus equals, which is how he learned to be the best fighter of all time, which is find your plus, which is your mentors, your teachers, your virtual mentors. And then the minus, and now you now you run all these um, training schools and stuff. Minus, I think, helps you solidify what you're learning because if you can't explain it and teach it, you probably didn't really learn it so well. Neil deGrasse Tyson is a great example of this. Who's his minus? Well, the 13 million Twitter followers he has, who watch, you know, who who used to watch the Cosmos TV show that he hosted, who listen to his podcast, who read his books. He's able to explain to such a point that the layman understands. And so that shows a true knowledge and understanding and a unique vision of what he's trying to say. Then there's the equals. So equals are people who are at roughly the same level as you at what you're trying to reinvent yourself in and what you're trying to learn. And they're striving just as hard as you. And maybe someone's striving harder. But you're all in there together. You're in the trenches together. Number seven, improving 1% a day. 1% a day compounded is 3,800% a year. Compounding, Warren Buffett calls it the eighth greatest wonder of the world. So it compounds, it, it multiplies exponentially instead of additionally. If you think about things in this 1% a day way, it's not like you get, oh, I'm gonna double my ability in a year or, or whatever. You're 38 times better in a year than you were at the beginning of the year. Now, what's interesting is, being 10% better at a skill is no good. If one of my competitors gets, is doing 1% a day, and then a year later we're both talking to the customer, my competitor will say, I'm 10 times better, just look at me. And the customer will say, oh yeah, you're right, why are we still with James? We should be working with you. If he was just 10% better, they might say, well, I don't know, I can't really tell, and James calls me every day and, and you don't, and I don't know, it's hard to tell, I can't figure it out. Number six, starting with an easy bullseye. If I always want to hit a bullseye, I'm not gonna put the target 100 yards away when I've never shot an arrow before. I wanna put the target right here and then I'll get a bullseye. Every step of the way, make the target as close as possible so you can hit the bullseye. Then move the target back a little bit, then get the bullseye. Then move the target back a little bit, then get the bullseye. That's a method for choosing yourself. Number five, belief divide. Right now, we live in such a polarized country. Half the country believes one thing, half the country believes the other, and this side and this side have unfriended each other on Facebook. So, are they all right? Is exactly 50% right and 50% wrong? Who knows? Number four, the key to happiness. Some people could say, well, I want to be happy all the time. The happy is just one emotion among thousands. Like I could be happy at a party, but you can't be having a party all the time. You spend a half hour at a party or an hour or two hours, you're no longer happy. It goes away, then you have to go on to the next thing. But well-being, you can have all the time. You can always feel like you're improving at something you love. 
You have good emotional relationships with friends, family, spouses, partners, and so on. And you can always have a sense of freedom. Number three, choose yourself or someone will choose for you. Business. I could start a business and I could say, oh, Mr. Venture Capitalist, I have a great idea about saving the world. Uh, if a billion people buy it, we'll make a trillion dollars. And now I have to wait to be chosen by the venture capitalist who gives me money. Yeah, let's say I need a million dollars to start my idea or else I can't start it. Now I'm waiting for some venture capitalist to choose me. I should instead say to a client, hey, I've got this idea, will you pay me $100 to do this for you? And if they say yes, I go to the next client. He had a good experience, will you pay me $200? And then I go to the next client, will you pay me $200? Now I go to the venture capitalist and I say, I don't need your money, I already have people paying me money and I'm profitable, now maybe I'll raise money. Or maybe I don't even need to raise money. I've chosen myself and because of that, I have more choices in the world. So every area of life you could think of, you either choose yourself or someone else is gonna choose you. Number two, entrepreneurship is hard. Everything about being an entrepreneur is hard. I actually hate being an entrepreneur. It's the worst possible job compared to almost anything else. For instance, Let's just compare it to a nine to five job. Being an entrepreneur is a 24 hour job. It's not an eight hour job. It's you never leave the business at work. You're always selling. You're always thinking about it. You wake up in the middle of the night thinking how you're gonna pay everybody because you're totally aware that the first person not getting paid is you. You never have to think about that in a nine to five job. And then you have to learn how to sell. You have to learn how to negotiate. You have to learn how to keep customers happy. You have to learn how to execute better than everyone else or else you'll lose the customer. So it was very hard. It was like being thrown into the fire and, and learning how to survive. And then selling the business. A lot of entrepreneurs are good at making a product, but they might not be good at selling their company or knowing this is the right time to sell the company. And then they fail to sell the company. It's hard to sell a company because someone asks you, why do you want to sell your company? Well, the only real answer is, I want to get rich. Number one, invest with the greats. If Warren Buffett buys IBM at 100, making up numbers, and now IBM drops to 80, if I ran into Warren Buffett at a party, I'm not gonna say, Warren, 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 what were you doing? IBM at 100, even I could have told you that was a stupid idea. No, Warren Buffett's the greatest investor in history. So he buys IBM at 100 and IBM's at 80. No questions asked, I'll buy IBM at 80. We got plenty more James Altucher content on our page. Subscribe and watch.